Let's talk about gold now. You said you've backed up the truck below seventeen hundred dollars uh, an ounce. You told me offline. Uh, okay, why, why did you do that? So that was probably the floor for you then. Hey, uh, seventeen hundred dollars an ounce. Well, as you know, I had not been in gold for several years, but in two thousand and eighteen, when it was at twelve hundred, I came back in a big way and rode it almost up to the two thousand. But when we got a couple weeks ago down below seventeen hundred. Two things made me very excited. One, sentiment levels or, or bullishness for gold was non-existent. I joked, and I know there's more of them, but I joked all three of us, meaning all three, the only three gold bulls, I would say that, you know, were in the market. But the other thing that came about, and I had sent it to you, uh, the most beautiful technical chart I've ever seen in 30-something years on any market was shown. And it, there's, a, there's a wonderful cup and handle formation now on gold going back 10 years. And it coincided with an absolute all-time bottom in relative strength, uh, which suggested to me with nobody bullish, market extremely oversold, and the greatest technical pattern you could ever have, for me anyway, was a cup and handle formation, plus the fundamentals and everybody hates gold or it's a relic and are talking about Bitcoin. I said, I'm backing my truck up. And it's contrarianism. There's very few true contrarians left. You know that. That's really what I've been my whole life. Uh, I'm the guy that watches and they say, ah, this team doesn't have a chance. And I just start rooting for them because everybody said they don't have a chance. But that was the main reason uh, to get back into goal. And I call it the March to 2000 again. I, I, we're, we're past our first hurdle, which I said was 16, I'm sorry, 1760. And if we can get a weekly close above 1810, I think we're running back to 2000 on gold again. Peter, what's your, um, what's your outlook on, we're well, not outlook, but what's your opinion on diversifying your portfolio? Uh, you hear that all the time from different financial advisors. I just want to hear what you think, because on the on the surface, you, you seem like a pretty risk averse guy, um, and you know you take positions and investments only that only after you understand these positions thoroughly, um, which is something that I can understand and respect. But every time you are bullish on something, you back up the truck and you go all in. <laughs> it doesn't seem like you diverse. It doesn't seem like you, it seems like you have so much conviction. You don't need to diversify. Am I correct to make that so, assessment? You're absolutely right. Uh, I'm married 40 years tomorrow. And if my <laughs> wife ever actually saw what I was doing over those years, there'd be no way I'd be celebrating a 40th wedding anniversary because any woman in her right mind would have left. OK, now I don't I, I didn't when I was a money manager and handled. I didn't do the same for others. But for my personal self, and that's all I speak about now to the general public and all for myself, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I, you know, diversification, I understand it and I know what people are saying, but if you're going to gamble and, and please, Dave, if, if I ever can say one thing on your program, Wall Street created the word speculating so it doesn't have to say what it really means. And that's gambling. But speculating and gambling is the same thing. You got to be prepared to lose part of all your money, both financially and mentally. Now, Wall Street does a half a good job of preparing people financially for risk, but they never understand mental anguish and how people end up feeling after they lost money because most people that work on Wall Street start making a pretty good money right away. So they've never had that feeling of, you know, man, I'm almost broke or I tapped out or whatever the case may be. So. The mental anguish is something that I still think we need a lot of work on, but you're correct. Uh, I like to focus in certain areas, and when I do, I feel to be most aggressive there versus trying to have 20 of them and hope 14 out of 20 work and I net coming ahead. Mm, interesting. All right. Finally, let's talk about something that you are very bullish on. You have uh, stated your conviction on this on my show last time you're on the program with me, which is uranium. You have called it the biggest bull market right now. Why hasn't the price moved up yet? Peter, I have one, just one question on uranium because you, you are very bullish on, on, on the metal. I wonder, I wonder what's driving the price or what should drive the price. As you may be aware, there's currently no production in North America right now, but there is still constant demand from the uranium, uh, for uranium um, from nuclear power generators and, uh, and perhaps even the government for the uranium reserves. So why are we seeing the price move up? Well, first of all, uh, I called it when I, in late 2019, I never owned uranium in any measurable way in my entire career. 
But at that point in time, it appeared to me that it was a no-brainer, what I called. And, you know, I bought things like Cameco at nine and some other things. And then finally last year uh, and into this year, we saw some in the public start to understand what's changing in the fundamentals for electrification. And, and if you're going to have all this, you know, green, green fields and all this other type of stuff, nuclear is going to have to play a big role. To answer your question and, and the $64,000 question is, when does the spot price go up? Because everybody's caught in their mind that you're really not going to see uranium stocks go up unless the spot price goes up a lot. The long-term contracts that most utilities bank on getting their utilities, they're not in the spot market every six months to buy just for the next six months. They like to lock in contracts for several years. We know from the few key producers, and to me, the single best and the bellwether of bellwethers and my largest holding, Cameco, we know that they keep telling us that a lot of those long-term contracts are coming to an end this year and next. So until those people come back in and then the public sees that they've now committed to more new long-term contracts and then realize how little production there is, that's when the spot price will skyrocket. And that'll be the key to the public to come rushing in. And I tell my friends that still listen to me, all two of them, that that's when we're going to need to be sellers, not buyers. But that's what's preventing the so-called spot price from going up a lot. The spot price is it's such a small market with such a few players. It, it, it's, it's not like looking at the oil and saying, look at what's happened to the oil price today and so forth and so on. But the argument to, to need nuclear has gotten so strong and turned on a dime to be so powerful. And yet with so few producers out there, the chemicals of the world, if you believe this story, are going to have the best years of their life. And hopefully their stock prices will also show that too. All right. Fantastic, Peter. Uh, great talk as always. Pleasure to now, have you on. I'm going to forward you some of that Bitcoin hate mail that's going to come in because of you. But Hey, don't put this back on me. But I'm 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 more than happy to take fifty percent of the blame. But I know no. you're not you know you're not a man to shy away no. from hate mail. So um, no. you know, the the more attention, the better is what I've learned. Uh, you're getting your message out, and people respect you for that. So thank you, uh, Peter. You're always welcome. a pleasure to have you on the show. Next time we'll catch up on different topics again. Thank you very much. Thank you, and God bless. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin.